Piotr Zalewski from European Stability Initiative in Istanbul. Uh, understandably, I'm very happy to see Turkey appear in the debate, um, especially because I see that each of our panelists is uh, capable of delivering a very unique national uh, angle or national perspective on this debate. Uh, my question is simply this. Uh, to what extent is Turkey still an asset is, to what extent is Turkish foreign policy still an asset to the transatlantic partners? And to what extent is it becoming a liability? Thank you. I, I, know, I think, um, okay, we'll take Robert and, and, the, and uh, a colleague from Luxembourg, the three questions, and this, the Turkish one is very important. Robert, uh, you're on to, I have you, Robert. Identify yourself, because I know you, but maybe others don't. Uh, Robert, Robert Shell, NATO HQ. Sorry, I, I have a question, but I, I need to respond to Mr. Fraser Cameron, because, I mean, I, it's, it's the most ingenious and strange proposal I've heard, that we should yeah. dissolve the, the NATO's military structure because the young generation doesn't find it relevant. I mean, we could might as well ban books and things like that. I mean, knowing my son's views, for example, on reading books. No, but speaking seriously, I mean, there is a huge demand for precisely the type of capability that NATO, whether you like it or not, has. That's the real world. That's the real world. My question is, however, because Secretary General is making right now, beginning a speech in Brussels about strategic concept. There you are. You can't be in two places at the same time, today. And one of the things he's going to say, apart from outlining his vision, is that uh, almost to quote, but he can change his speech, but it's basically that there is no place but NATO uh, where Europe and North America sit together every day uh, to discuss security issues that affect us and figure out how to tackle them. And I just want to put this issue to the panel because when discussing how uh, we want to face those challenges, it's rather important to uh, have some more structured views where this discussion should be placed. And of course, mm. there's quite a lot of candidates. I would like to be interested in panel's views mm. on that. And the last question before we go on to another group of questions, uh, this gentleman from Luxembourg, please. And keep it short. <laughs> a question, please. Short, yeah. Identify yourself. It's uh, difficult for a tall man from a tiny country. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, a few sh short questions then. No, no, uh, uh, one question. Everybody's allowed one question and a tiny little, little comment oh, and one question. Otherwise, we'll never finish it. Yet we have to really make it as wide as possible. I'm sorry. There are the rules for me. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, then the question is how to choose. No, what I'm bothered about a bit at this kind of forum, that there's a kind of pre-established <laughs> consensus or pre-established harmony. So, and my disappointment is that, as I saw yesterday and this continues, that Southern East European never even tried to think by themselves or for themselves. There has been this more or less benign, friendly takeover. So uh, my question is uh, then, um, what, is, uh, what is the transatlantic community about? It's, uh, <laughs> it's not a civilizational pro project, I guess. It's about exporting democracy. I, I, I don't think so. It can be about anything else preserving interest, stability, certainly not, certainly not about democracy or exporting democracy. And the EU may be about democracy, but um, it cannot guarantee <laughs> democracy. And my question then uh, is what to do about countries? And I think this question has not been touched about. It's a very important one for all, do I see, uh, Europeans or not. There's a rise of extreme rightist um, movements and parties everywhere. And get in, in Europe and getting or trying to get into in, into governments, into governmental responsibility. What to, to do about them? Shall they be kicked out? There was the case of Austria with Haider, but if there are five, yeah. five also five Haider, five uh, or ten, what to do about it? Yeah. What about political punishment, sanctions, kicking them out Wait, of the EU? So the um, what to do about this rising intolerance, yeah. uh, xenophobia, Islamophobia in Europe, and these parties defending this? In other words, in other words, does the EU have any sanctions against Thank you for being members? tolerant with me. No, no, so, no I'm always tolerant. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's this group of Don't forget now, we've got the big important Turkish question. I'm going to go to a group of questions again. The big important question about Turkey, uh, the important question about NATO and and, and, it's, and, and it's, I suppose it's appeal to Robert and uh, Sek Jen's uh, speech today. And, um, you know, can the EU, no, uh, yeah, whoever wants to answer it, and the EU, can it have sanctions against its own members? It tried against Austria, and look what happened. So, 
Who wants to pick up? And let's do Turkey first. I think it's very important. Well, you know, I'll tell you that uh, back in 1990, at the enthronement ceremony of the new emperor of Japan, we had a bilateral meeting, Romania and, uh, and Turkey. And I remember that the late uh, Turgut Ozal, president of Turkey at that time, welcomed us with the words, well, Turkey has had a bad century, but what's it one century in uh, many centuries history? So I think you know that this is reflecting the philosophy of the Turks. Uh, and I think you know that here it is, the more we leave Turkey uh, to move away from Europe, the more the problem, uh, the, the, I mean the answer to your uh, solution would be that there will be a different policy compared to ours. Uh, we should somehow try to coordinate and, and be honest about those negotiations of accepting Turkey. Because to my mind, this is a who blinks first game, in which you know, we try to pass the, the guilt of interrupting the negotiations and renouncing to this to the Turks, because we don't want to do it, because we have engaged into them. So I think you know, that we should be honest about this first, and secondly, we should be pragmatic about it. And then we'll have probably an answer to your question. Mm. Anybody else want to pick up the Turkey on that yeah. With respect, I think, is Turkey an asset or a liability to, to, to the West? I think that's um, a very old-fashioned question. I think we need to understand that we're no longer with a, a united West confronting some, some enemy on the other side of a line and you have to assess whether countries in between, which side of the line they stand. When it comes to Turkey, Turkey is in a very different geographic situation to Europe. It is from America, there's the complication of the, the membership application. The fact that they are our neighbors, that they are a hugely important Islamic society, Europe's geostrategic interests in how it rubs along with the Islamic world are very different from those of the United States. So one should not be approaching the issue of Turkey from the assumption that somehow there is a total congruity or identity of interest between Europe and the United States in how relations work out with Turkey. This is a multipolar world. Turkey is a rising pole. We shouldn't be thinking of it as an asset or a liability, but as an actor that we should deal with. Yes, uh, just to second uh, Nick's comments, I think the question is not whether Turkey should be more aligned or not. It's how we're going to uh, be ready to take advantage of this new Turkey. And, and indeed, Turkey is sitting in the middle of a region where it has a lot of uh, different interests compared to, to Europe. So I think if we are in a multipolar polar world, we should also see ourselves as in a multipolar Europe. Uh, and we should uh, develop a Europe and foreign policy on that basis. So for example, on Turkey, I think the enlargement process uh, being stalled is a huge impediment to us having a real strategic discussion with Turkey on how we're going to work on Iraq, how we're going to work together on Iran, how we're going to work together on the peace process. So I'm not suggesting here we should uh, 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 get rid of the enlargement process, but we should not lose some real strategic opportunities and we should think harder about how to talk to Turkey about some, some real cooperation. Can we tackle the extreme right? And, and yeah. yeah, on the extreme right, I, th I think this is, this is a good question because this is about also Europe's image in the world. Uh, we, we go uh, outside the world and, and preach political reform, etc. And if you look at our internal politics, they're not uh, always uh, pretty. Uh, and I think you, you, you have a point here, and uh, the United States in the 60s had exactly the same problem about the civil rights, uh, where it was going in the third world, and the third world was saying, well, look at how you treat your own people. So I think there is, there is a real perceptions issue, but I think the, the, the coming back of the extreme rights in some of the European countries is really due to uh, low politics. Uh, immigration has relatively kind of stalled over the last 10 years. It has not been as high as in the uh, early 90s, late 80s. So it is more a political tool than a, a social reality. There are tensions, obviously, between communities and different culture, but they're overplayed by some specific parties. And I think it's a, the here the onus is really on our political leaders to try to play the mainstream politics uh, against the kind of more polarized politics. Mm. Mm. Two comments uh, yeah. co briefly. On Turkey, I believe uh, this is no longer the case that we can have a single track of sort of single uh, relationship just on a single track, which is accession track. 
I think we need to have, we need to think strategically about EU foreign policy. And if we think about various ways how we can measure the success of the newly born EU foreign policy, I would say I want to see in five year time, in five years time, how far we can get with Ukraine, Serbia and Turkey. And that will be for me the measure of whether we have been successful or whether we will, we will have been successful in, uh, in our foreign policy. So we need a true, genuine strategic partnership with Turkey, recognizing also its sometimes differing interest mm. um, with the European Union. Union. My second comment is, and it's not uh, just political correctness having, having seen many diplomats here from member states, I don't think that the rise of uh, uh, populist parties is such a problem in Europe. I mean, you have all shades of populist parties all over Europe. But the biggest uh, challenge is the fact that um, uh, European nations are turning their back on the European idea. And of course, this is a different um, dimension of the discussion about the sort of the, uh, the challenges in front of the European Union. But I believe this is the real challenge. This is really the big problem. And if you, Judy, you know very well the situation and the debates in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Germany right in the middle of the uh, biggest uh, uh, crisis, a mental crisis about Europe, which was just a few days after the, the, the decisions on the 9th of May uh, to save uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe me, I was taking part in a forum in Aachen, just ahead of the Karl Prize ceremony uh, for Donald Tusk. And I was shocked by the level of sort of by, by, by the low um, feelings uh, and the sort of the sadness and the sort of the, the distress that was uh, visible among a very prominent group of political leaders and uh, opinion leaders uh, in Germany. This is really a problem. Mm. Thank you very much for that.